So I've been talking about this concept that I call an intelligence optimum uh, for quite a while now. I've mentioned it on videos, a couple interviews, a couple of blog posts, and that sort of thing. But I think it bears repeating right now, particularly as we're looking at the fact that more and more benchmarks are being saturated, but at the same time, the subjective experience of most people's, uh, like the, the intelligence that you're getting from chatbots seems to be, I don't know if it's diminishing because certainly every time there's, there's a leap uh, in model capability, we find more things that we can do with them and they get better at being agentic and that sort of thing. At the same time, there's a lot of people that are posting things like this, you know, uh, in the in the 90s and 2000s, when graphics were improving rapidly, your perception of the graphics improvements really kind of tapered off once you got into the tens of thousands of triangles. Now, if you're not familiar, every triangle is basically how a mesh is defined uh, in a video game or CGI. And once you have a high enough resolution, your eye can't really tell the difference. And so you see... Uh, for every order of magnitude you go up at 60 triangles, it's like you can't, you can barely tell what it is. At 600 triangles, you can say, "Oh, that looks, you know, vaguely Thomas Jefferson." And then by 6,000, you're like, "Okay, that's that's a pretty solid mesh." But qualitatively, there's not much difference between 60,000 and 600. Or sorry, that's six million triangles. Um, so that's actually several orders of magnitude jump. Now, people are starting to wonder: Is this going to be the case when LLMs get that much bigger as well? And I suspect that the answer is yes. And so here's why. When you talk about like, okay, LLM capability, it's, not, it's, it's obviously a little bit apples to oranges because the way a transformer works is a little bit different than the way that a human brain works. At the same time, we also de do see some convergence, meaning that uh, the way that they process tasks, the way that they represent tasks tends to have some similarities to human brains. Now, when you say, okay, well, what actually goes into intelligence? You know, it's like, well, is it solving problems? Is it reducing free energy? That's kind of looking at the outcome and kind of trying to characterize it from an outcome. But if you look at the building blocks of intelligence, there's what we call things like cognitive primitives and cognitive tasks. So basically, how do you represent information and then how can you manipulate that information? That is fundamentally what intelligence comes down to, is the ability to represent information in your head and the ability to manipulate that information uh, in a way that is useful and efficient. So if you, if you break it down into first principles and say intelligence is about representations and manipulations, those are the cognitive primitives we're talking about. At a certain point, when we look at humans, there's a certain threshold above which, which generally happens around 130 or 140 IQ, depending on how you measure it and et cetera, et cetera, you know, everyone will say uh, in before, you know, IQ is a bad measurement. Yes, everyone knows that IQ is a bad measurement, but it measures something in the same way that GDP is a bad measurement, but it measures something. So it looks like when you look across the, the full history of smart people, specifically humans uh, throughout history, it looks like something interesting happens once you get above 130 to 140 IQ, which is that your brain is able to generate any cognitive primitive. Uh, meaning that with enough time and effort, you're able to learn to do pretty much anything you set your mind to, whether that's quantum physics or chess or computer programming, that sort of thing. Now, you might say, okay, well, why does IQ keep going up then? Uh, again, it depends on how you measure it because speed is often a proxy for G-factor or fluid intelligence, meaning that you, know, you, can, you can achieve the same things, but you can, you can do it faster than someone else which is why an ELO score in chess, so ELO is how, how you're ranked in chess, an ELO score is roughly uh, correlated to your IQ. So the higher your ELO score, the higher your IQ, because that is just almost a one-to-one -one comparison between you know one grandmaster and the next. Now, obviously, there's always, there's always, always, always more nuance to it than that, but these are some rough rules of thumb. Now, once we get past that intelligence optimum in machines, which I don't think we're there yet, so the intelligence optimum in machines basically means that your transformer or your agent model or world model or whatever, you know, whether it's for robots or anything, you can have a universal model, is able to perform every representation that it needs, uh, and then it's able to perform every manipulation on, that re on those representations. Once you get to that point, all models are fundamentally going to have the same abilities. Now, they might you might have models that are more purpose-built for something of uh, one task over another, like for one for writing fiction, one for solving medical issues, one for controlling robots, and those sorts of things. But 
beyond that, once you get to that that intelligence optimum, which I would define that as like crossing all of those thresholds would probably be what some people would say is that's that's true general intelligence because now you're representing literally all cognitive primitives. Um, I would probably say that is super intelligence because most humans, even really high IQ ones, even though you have the capacity to represent every primitive, that doesn't mean that there is any one human that is able to represent every cognitive primitive. Um, just because you're smart enough that you could, hypothetically, with enough time and training, um, but you know we have only got a couple decades to learn stuff, and also your brain starts to calcify. Not literally calcify, but that's a term from chess, where it just becomes harder and harder to learn new things because you, learn, you lose neuroplasticity. So... Once we get to that point, whatever you call that arbitrary threshold, whether you call it AGI or ASI, it doesn't really matter. Beyond that point, you're basically just earning vanity points, meaning you can make the, the parameter count larger, you can, make it, uh, you can make it deeper, you can make it dense connected or whatever, it doesn't really matter because your neural network now is, has the ability to represent any cognitive primitive um, and then it's able to perform any manipulation on those cognitive primitives meaning the, 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 the kind of bottleneck then switches to speed and efficiency. And this is what I've been saying for a long time. Once we hit that cognitive, that, that, that cognitive horizon where you've, you've saturated all cognitive primitives and all, um, and all manipulations, that is the intelligence optimum. So it's like, okay, we now have the, the high enough G factor or G factor equivalent in our models that they can do anything that we set them to. Now what you really care about is how fast is it and how energy efficient is it. And you know that basically correlates to how much RAM does it take uh, to run. Because when you have these gigantic models and you have, if it's, if it's a smaller footprint in memory, that means it is a smaller footprint in processing, which means that it is a smaller footprint in energy, which also means that it is faster and more efficient. They're all kind of highly correlated. I know that there's going to be uh, there's a lot more math to it than that. You know, there's attention algorithms and those sorts of things. So it's not just the raw model size. There's more more dimensions to it, but that's a good proxy. A smaller model in memory is able to run faster. You're going to have a hard time disagreeing with that. So I just wanted to throw this out there and say that, like, yeah, this is something that I've been thinking about, and I'm glad that other people are noticing this and asking these questions um, I, I do suspect that we will hit an intelligence optimum. Um, it's not necessarily a, a, a maximum intelligence. So this is one thing that I'll, I'll ca clarify, and it might sound like a well actually. Um, well, actually, you can continue getting smarter, meaning that you could probably continue to represent more and more high order abstractions uh, as, as cognitive primitives. So that would be like, can you represent the entire human timeline as a single object in memory? That would require probably a lot more than 10 trillion parameters. That would probably require, I don't know, hundreds of trillions. Just a wild ass guess. Um, but the point is, is that uh, once you are able to represent enough cognitive primitives and cognitive operations to at least build or use a system that has those better representations, you don't need to have that representation in your own head. It's kind of like the guild navigators from Dune, right? The reason that they did so much spice over many thousands of years is so that they could represent all of the possibility spaces and travel more efficiently through, was it hyperspace? I don't remember what they called it in Dune. But anyways, that's an example of being able to hold literally all possible futures in your head as a single representation. So that would basically be like a Gaussian splat, but for time. <laughs> like, so that would probably require more than 10 trillion parameters if I had to guess, although we might find new efficiencies. Um, but that's an example of a larger, more sophisticated cognitive primitive that humans really just can't hold. But then you ask, well, what's the point if you can just delegate to a purpose-built machine and, and ASIC that is able to do that for you, then your general purpose, general intelligence, uh, whether it's an AGI or ASI, is then able to just, you know, program that machine, that very purpose-built machine. So like an alpha fold, but for, you know, star charts or that sort of thing. So we are going to see more and more differentiation, which is something that is what you expect to see at this point um, as, a, as a general purpose technology like deep learning uh, starts to really become saturated where you say, oh, well, we can use this as a robot model. We can use this for uh, finding proteins. We can use this for agent models and that sort of thing. So I would also not expect it to be one monolithic model, although we pro probably will have monolithic foundation models as the general intelligences, and those will be, you know, the things managing other agents and other purpose-built tools uh, instead of humans doing it because they'll be able to do it faster and better and smarter and cheaper and so on and so forth. 
So anyways, let me know what you think about this idea. Um, you know, a, lo a lot of this is still based on analogies to the human brain. Uh, so we will not necessarily know until we build it. Um, but this is what I currently kind of anticipate and expect. Um, and time will tell. It might be that we find that there is no upper bound uh, to uh, functional intelligence and that uh, maybe maybe we're wrong and there are an infinite number of more and more sophisticated and abstract cognitive primitives that they are able to uh, discover in their latent space, they being transformers and deep learning networks, um, but maybe not. And, and certainly the ability to represent all of time and space as a single cognitive primitive, you might ask, what's the point? Um, but then, you know, like maybe, maybe that's what Ultron was doing and Ultron was able to model and Ultron from, you know, the Avengers movies, by the way, Ultron was able to model and say, okay, I'm able to hold a cognitive primitive in my head to say, I know what the fate of humanity is. Let me just go ahead and get to the point. Um, so who knows? Uh, a lot of that is fiction. Some of this is analogies. Some of this is proxies between neuroscience and computer science. And those proxies are again, just proxies. So with that, I'm going to stop rambling and say thanks for watching and cheers. Have a good one.